All right, we're going to start back up with our shock. This is our second video on shock. And uh, this one's really going to be about diagnosis. And as we said in the previous video, you're going to recognize shock by looking for hypoperfusion of organs as it's evidenced through various organ systems or the blood pressure. Uh, but you also got to to break it down into one of these categories. Do we have pump failure? Do we have pipe failure? Or do we have tank failure? And these are the causes, cardiogenic, distributive and obstructive for the pipes, and hypovolemic for the tank. So how do you know? So the person in shock is going to have nonspecific symptoms, along with complaining of feeling dizzy, maybe they feel fatigued or dehydration, as well as some specific symptoms that will help point towards what, ca what cause it is. So someone with uh, cardiogenic shock may have chest pain, shortness of breath or dyspnea on exertion, and on their physical exam, they may have signs of CHF, they may have JVD, pulmonary edema, they may have, may have a murmur. Now, distributive shock, these, you know, tends to be something like sepsis that might be the cause. So they might have a fever, maybe a cough, maybe some vomiting or diarrhea, maybe even belly pain or something that points to an infectious source. And that works for sepsis, but if it's maybe anaphylaxis, then maybe they were just stung by a bee. Or maybe they ate something that they shouldn't have eaten, like seafood. And they may have signs of allergy, like hives, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, trouble breathing, wheezing, swollen face. And if it's a neurologic cause, then uh, you know, from, uh, then they may have some neurologic symptoms, like numbness or weakness. Uh, bradycardia, I remember, goes with that, and there might be some trauma in the history. Now let's look at the obstructive causes. Uh, if it's PE, look for PE risk factors. And on physical, you might look for things like a DVT. Maybe their SATs are low. Maybe they're having trouble breathing. For a tension pneumothorax, you're going to look for your classic triad of JVD, decreased breath sounds on one side, and tracheal deviation. And then, of course, for hypovolemic, there'll be bleeding if it's a hemorrhagic shock. And if it's uh, decreased input or output, maybe they're, they're not eating or drinking, or maybe they have vomiting or diarrhea or melena. So I'd say rather than memorize a long list of symptoms, try and uh, organize this list so that it makes sense. Like what are the things you look for? Cardiogenic, distributive, obstructive, and hypovolemic. Now similarly, we could look at what you need to do for testing. So we'll of course start with some generic tests uh, as well. Like looking at a glucose, and you can get either an ABG or a VBG. Personally, I prefer the VBG because it gives you almost exact same information as the ABG without any of the risks of doing the ABG. Mainly, you'll get the pH, the CO2, base excess, and lactate, among other things. And then, if you're looking for a cardiogenic shock, what would you get? Well, of course, you're going to get an EKG and a troponin. You can get a chest x-ray to look at the heart size, especially if you're worried about cardiac tamponade. Your distributive shock, you're going to look for things that might help you pin down a source of infection, so you'll probably get a UA, you'll probably get a chest x-ray. A CBC is not going to help you pin down a source of infection, but you're probably going to get that. Uh, just look at the white count. Actually, it's probably more useful for looking at the hemoglobin for two reasons. Number one, if they're bleeding, and number two, we know that one of the most important contributions uh, of hemoglobin is the carrying of oxygen, so if it's low, we know also get uh, cultures, because that'll help you with uh, management antibiotic choice later. For obstructive shock, if you're worried about tension pneumothorax, you're probably just going to treat it. For a PE, uh, you're going to uh, not get a D-diamond. They're probably going to be too unstable for a CT, so you could try an ultrasound, which we'll talk about later, or you might just treat that. But you probably will end up getting a chest x-ray, even if you're treating a tension pneumothorax. And then finally, for your hypovolemic cause you need to get a pregnancy test make sure that this is not an ectopic pregnancy that is causing the patient to hemorrhage you're going to get the CBC just to look for the hemoglobin you want to get a type in screen or maybe even a type in cross if you're worried about bleeding you need to give blood and coags again if you're worried about bleeding these are just some of the things you would want to get there are of course others based on the patient that you have in front of you all right let's talk about one other thing that you're probably never going to see, but it has some historical significance, I guess, and maybe someone will ask you questions on it at some point. And that's the oxygen extraction that we talked about earlier. Now, there's two places that you could measure oxygen extraction, uh, and that really means uh, how much, you know, 
And remember, oxygen extraction is the amount of oxygen that was taken out. We can't measure that, but we can measure what's left, right? So we're going to measure what's left. And that's going to be the saturation of oxygen in the central venous system. So that means in the SVC, you can do that by putting in a central line. Or you could measure the oxygen saturation in the mixed blood that comes from below the IVC as well as the SVC, mixes in the heart and then goes into the pulmonary arteries and into the lungs. And that's called uh, the SVO2, and you're going to measure that with a pulmonary artery catheter. And this catheter is a big deal to put in, so you're, uh, you're really going to see that placed in the emergency department because it requires a lot of time and effort. Uh, we are more concerned with resuscitating the patient than getting these small uh, the, you know these these numbers here but you might see it in an intensive care unit and I put in the normal values here for the central venous oxygen saturation you're gonna see something normally greater than 70 percent so the blood returning back should be around 70 percent a little bit more than that and mixed in IVC blood so the mixed one will be somewhere between 60 and 80 uh, and so if you see numbers that are much lower than this you know that there is some hypoperfusion going on, at least in the sense that the oxygen extraction is increased, that the tissues are trying to pull out as much oxygen from the blood as they can, leaving very little left, and that's why the saturation is lower. So we'll just leave it there. Lower is bad. You probably will never see this, but at least we talked about it. Now another great tool that you can use is the ultrasound, because you can pretty much diagnose each one of these things. If you're looking at cardiogenic shock, you can actually just look at the entire heart and see if the heart is pumping properly. You can look at the valves. You can look at the pericardial sac to see if there's any blood in that space. For a PE with obstructive shock, you can look to see if the right heart is working extra hard. It might be dilated. It might even be encroaching upon the left side. You can look for a pneumothorax, and we already said that you can look, at, look for tamponade by looking at the pericardial sac. And, oh, I forgot, for PE, you can also look for a DVT in uh, the leg. And part of the care for sepsis is to see if the patient is still fluid responsive. Uh, and that actually tends, you know, fits in with the hypovolemic area. So you can look at the IVC, the inferior vena cava, and if you're able to squish it down with your probe or it changes with uh, inspiration, then there's probably not enough fluid in there to keep it open. For hemorrhagic shock, for trauma, you could do a fast exam looking for blood in the abdomen. And you could even see blood in the chest. And you maybe also would look for a triple A that could have ruptured. And for hypovolemia, we already talked about checking for fluid responsiveness, responsiveness by looking at the IVC. So with ultrasound, you're really able to do a lot. You're able to look at the heart. You're able to look at the vascular tone, or at least evidence of problems with the vascular tone. And you're able to judge uh, the volume status. So that really gets you a long way uh, on this pump, pipe, tanks, pumps, pipes, tank uh, paradigm. So the ultrasound test that most people use, or protocol, I should say, is called the RUSH protocol. And it stands for the Rapid Ultrasound for Shock and Hypotension. And so the person who's doing the resuscitation should not be the one doing the ultrasound because whoever's doing the ultrasound is going to be focused on that and not on resuscitating the patient. And so what's the problem in shock? You have a low blood pressure, right? You have low perfusion, and so your mean arterial blood pressure is low. So what do we want? You want a high MAP. So that's our goal, to have a high MAP. And of course, this stands for something. Uh, all the places that you want to look. The heart, the IVC, Morrison's, pouch, the aorta, and look for a pneumothorax. This is just a screening exam, so it's just something you can do quickly at the bedside. So we'll just go over these very quickly, and maybe in another video we'll go through this in more detail. So first thing you're going to look at is the heart, right? So you're going to do a parasternal long axis and you get a good view of the heart. Next, you look at the IVC, looking for fluid responsiveness. And if you can see 50% collapse of the IVC, you think then this guy needs more fluid. Then the next one that we're going to do is uh, Morrison's pouch. And while you're there, you may as well look for a pneumothorax because the lung, the base of the lung is right there. And you'll probably do the other side too, looking at the splenorenal space because, you know, it's just on the opposite side. And you can also look for a pneumothorax on that side as well. Okay, we got H-I-M, now we need A. And A is for aorta, and you're, this is going to be a long view. You're going to slide the probe down here, looking at the aorta all the way down to the bifurcation. And you want to look for anything that's greater than three centimeters. That would represent possibly an aneurysm. 
All right, there's two other places you could look for a pneumothorax, and that's up here in the chest. And so those are two more pneumothorax views. You may as well finish off your FAST exam and do a bladder view. And also, you know, for looking for PE, you may as well look for a DVT. And that finishes off our high map, plus a little BD at the end, bladder DVT, to look for potential sources of the shock. And remember, it shouldn't be the person leading the resuscitation, but someone else doing it. And they should not get in the way of any other treatment. So that concludes this video, looking at the diagnosis of the potential causes pipe of pump, pipe, and tank failure. And in the next video, we'll go and look at treatment. All right, I'll see you there. Bye-bye.